Hello? Ah, is it recording? Okay, perfect. Good. Um, good evening, and welcome to the book lounge organized by the Center for Grant Strategy of the World Studies Department at King's College London. Uh, my name is Eleonora Natale. I am a lecturer in international history at the Department of World Studies and a member of the Center for Grand Strategy. Uh, I'm very happy today of, um, to have here uh, Dr. Flavia Gaspari, who is presenting her book, uh, US Foreign Policy and the End of the Cold War in Africa, A Bridge Between Global Conflict and the New World Order. Uh, Dr. Gaspari is lecturer in World Studies Education, co-chair of the Africa Research Group, and member of the Center for Grant Strategy at the Department of World Studies. Um, she completed her PhD here at King's College in 2014. Uh, for her research, uh, she received a scholarship from our graduate school and three grants from the Royal Historical Society, the European Association for American Studies, and the Scowcraft uh, Institute of International Affairs. Uh, she was also a visiting fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Um, besides being an estimated member of our department, uh, Dr. Gaspari has been a teaching fellow and academic tutor at the Defense Studies Department at the Joint Services Command and Staff College and at the Royal uh, College of Defense Studies. Um, Dr. Gaspari's research uh, focuses on the study of the Cold War in the Third World, the development of post Cold War US foreign policy and US Africa relations. Uh, she has also worked on US policy in the Rwandan genocide and in the Great Lakes region. And today we also have the great pleasure of having here Dr. Marco Biss uh, from Lancaster University. Thank you for being our discussion today. Um, Dr. Witt is the Director of the Center of War and uh, Diplomacy and Reader in International History of the Cold War at Lancaster. Um, his research focuses um, especially on uh, the international history of the Cold War, particularly in sub saharan Africa, but he also researches uh, the peacekeeping in Africa and uh, the transformation of European armed forces uh, since the end of the Cold War. So I'm very excited about this uh, book launch. Uh, we had a great turnout for this event, and uh, so I'll let in a minute uh, Flavia present her work. Um, uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat uh, function um, at the bottom of your uh, screen. Uh, we will pick them up um, at the end of the presentation. And also, I would like to remind you that we are recording this event uh, via Zoom, and then we will upload it to um, our YouTube channel in case you want to rewatch it or share it. So, uh, Flavia, I leave the uh, floor to you. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Eleonora, for this uh, kind of introduction and for being uh, uh, our chair tonight. Uh, um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for being uh, virtually here tonight to hear about uh, my book. And of course, a special thanks to uh, Marco. I'm particularly glad to have you here as a discussant of my book. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing your uh, comments. Uh, so basically, in the next uh, few minutes, um, I want to just briefly uh, present my book, of course, uh, the genesis of the book, the origin, and its, its main point. Um, so uh, let me first of all uh, share uh, with you uh, a brief PowerPoint that I am prepared for you. So maybe you can uh, follow. Okay, so hope you can all uh, see my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, um, uh, so basically, as you may see from, um, uh, from the uh, title of the book, my book is a, a study of uh, US foreign policy in Africa uh, between 1988 and 1994. So at the juncture of the end of the Cold War. And uh, I think in order to basically explain uh, uh, what the starting point uh, of, the, of the book was, uh, I can start with, uh, uh, by showing you this, uh, uh, this quote. Uh, the future competition with the United States will take place not in Europe and not in the Atlantic Ocean directly. Uh, it will take place in Africa and in Latin America. We will compete for every piece of land, for every country. 
This quote comes from Yuri Andropov, 1965. Uh, Andropov will uh, later become uh, the general secretary of the Communist Party of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and um, he said in 1965, uh, the competition will take place in Africa and Latin America. Uh, at the end of the day, the competition uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union took place on many fronts, from a nuclear war to a propaganda war. But uh, Andrew uh, was right, as he said, it, it was true that um, it is true that Africa and Latin America, together with other areas of uh, what became known as the third world, uh, played a, an important and very complex uh, role in the, uh, in the superpower rivalry in the Cold War. And uh, when Andropov in 1965 said, we won't compete uh, in Europe, uh, actually he, he was right. Uh, if you think about uh, the battle for Europe was uh, already settled quite early in the Cold War, was over to some extent quite early in the Cold War, already uh, in the 50s with the, with the division, uh, after the division of Germany, after the creation of NATO, after the creation of the Warsaw Pact, uh, the two blocks uh, in Europe, the rule of the games of the Cold War in Europe was uh, already very clear, was already uh, frozen, uh, if you want. Uh, the Cold War at that point became uh, instead a global uh, competition. Um, from Berlin, from Europe, the Cold War radiated outwards. Uh, progressively invested uh, new areas uh, and regions of the planet, particularly during uh, and after the process of uh, decolonization with the creation of the so-called uh, Third World. Um, so over the last, uh, over the past 10, uh, 15 years, um, the Third World has progressively acquired uh, centrality in the study of the, of the Cold War. I, I put here in the PowerPoint a couple of, uh, uh, of quotes uh, from this type of literature, uh, which summarize very well uh, the idea that at the end of the day, the real deal, the real stake of the Cold War was uh, uh, indeed the battle for winning hearts and minds of the Third World. Uh, the Cold War, to some extent, was fought for and in the name of the Third World, precisely because the battle for Europe was already settled uh, early in the Cold War. Uh, so there is this um, uh, increasing attention to uh, the development of the Cold War in the Third World, how uh, the Cold War had uh, invaded at some point uh, uh, these uh, uh, new areas of the, of the world coming out from decolonization. However, uh, what I noticed is that uh, when we look at the, at the end of the Cold War, at the last part of the Cold War, the way in which the Cold War ended, uh, um, this attention to the Third World vanished uh, once again. Uh, when we mention uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, these are indeed the images that immediately uh, came out uh, in, uh, to our mind. So, of course, uh, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the revolution in Eastern Europe, uh, the end of the Soviet Union. These are the images, the, the moments that even symbolically we link uh, we to the end of the Cold War. However, these images uh, um, document uh, just one of what I call the many ends of the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War, as I said, was a, was a global uh, conflict. The Cold War played an important role in the Third World. The Cold War had many battlegrounds uh, in the Third World. And uh, consequently, I would say that there are many different ends of the Cold War. Uh, it's not true that the uh, narrative of end of the Cold War uh, centered on, on Europe necessarily applies or has the same uh, meaning for all the battlegrounds, all the battlefields of the global uh, Cold War. Um, there are indeed many ends of the Cold War and each of these ends, uh, each end of the Cold War uh, opened a different, uh, a different series of new challenges and opportunities for the post-Cold War international system, led, of course, by the sole remaining uh, American superpower during the so-called unipolar uh, moment. Uh, and this aspect uh, is, uh, is quite important in consideration of the fact that um, 
some of the most important crises of the um, uh, US-led New World Order during the 90s, some of the most important crises of this New World Order happened precisely in those regions of the world that they once uh, uh, were part of the of the third world battlegrounds of the Cold War. Uh, for example, the Gulf War or the Somali Sea War in the early 90s, just to mention a couple of, uh, of examples. So uh, in my book, uh, I wanted to uh, investigate uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, different uh, ends uh, of the Cold War and uh, its impact on post Cold War US foreign policy. And it looks at one specific uh, um, case, one specific case study, which is the African continent and uh, more uh, specifically Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Uh, why Africa? Um, <coughs> the African continent um, is a very interesting case in the complex uh, context of the end of the Cold War in the Third World and the shaping of US foreign policy in the early, uh, in the early 90s. Um, Africa was indeed uh, an important battlefield of the, of the Cold War, an often neglected battlefield of the Cold War. Uh, Africa joined the Cold War a bit later compared to um, other areas of the Third World, like, for instance, South Asia, uh, mostly because the continent decolonized uh, a bit later. And Africa acquired uh, importance uh, for the Cold War, uh, particularly uh, during the 70s, um, in coincidence uh, with the beginning of, of uh, two conflicts uh, in two specific areas of the continent, uh, which are also the focus, the main focus on, of my uh, book, uh, Southern Africa and the Horn of Africa. So we see these two important conflicts, uh, one major regional war in uh, Southern Africa, uh, which also saw the involvement of many uh, regional actors, uh, Angola, Namibia, South Africa, Zaire, and so on, and uh, a minor uh, border uh, dispute in the Horn of Africa between Somalia and uh, Ethiopia, the so-called Ogaden uh, War. Now, um, the two superpowers and the two blocs, uh, together with other important international actors of the Cold War, like uh, China or Cuba, uh, all these international actors and the two superpowers massively intervened in these uh, conflicts, tried to use these conflicts as proxies, uh, supported the local actors in these conflicts to stop uh, each other's uh, influence. And by doing so, of course, uh, through these interventions, uh, they interfered, they distorted the local uh, routes, the development of these conflicts, uh, and sometimes the outcomes of these conflicts. Uh, at the same time, on the other hand, uh, the local actors, the regional actors, uh, also exploited the intervention of the external actors, also exploited them the superpower competitions, uh, played, uh, played one superpower off against the other in order to reach their uh, own goals in these wars, in these conflicts. So all, all this process uh, basically created uh, an overlap uh, between the regional dynamics uh, and the interest of the uh, local actors and the global dynamics of the, of the Cold War. The Cold War, which uh, in those years, uh, during the 70s, was going through uh, the process of the town. And this overlap was particularly evident in, in Africa. I put here a famous uh, quote from uh, the US National uh, Security Advisor during the Carter administration, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, Brzezinski uh, famously stated that uh, the, SALT, um, the SALT agreement lies buried in the sands of Ogaden. The SALT agreement was possibly uh, the, greatest, the greatest accomplishment of the US-Soviet dialogue on arms control during the 70s. Uh, uh, this agreement, together with the whole uh, Tant process, eventually collapsed in 1979, after the two superpowers clashed uh, in the Ogaden War, in, the, in these conflicts uh, in, the, in the Horn of Africa. And the Ogaden War, in, in this regard, really was uh, an important reason uh, for, that undermined the detente uh, process, together with many other factors, of course. So I think this quote uh, encapsulates very well, um, sorry, encapsulates uh, very well how, um, uh, basically, the, uh, encapsulates very well the, the core periphery uh, interactions, uh, how the superpowers' disagreement over their respective uh, policies during the Ethiopian Somali border dispute, which was indeed a minor and a marginal conflict for them, 
But their disagreement on this conflict ended up in significantly affecting uh, the global dynamic of the Cold War and of the detente. So we really see here a mutual influence between the global and the local. Uh, and this overlap, this core periphery interconnection, this overlap between the global and the, glo and, and the local uh, really was uh, one of the main ways in which the Cold War developed and materialized in, in Africa. Furthermore, uh, when we look uh, instead at the post-Cold War uh, period, at the, at the unipolar uh, moment, uh, we see how the involvement of the United States uh, um, in, uh, in the continent, the African continent, particularly in those uh, regions which were uh, mostly uh, affected, which were more affected uh, by the Cold War, again, Southern Africa and the Horn of Africa, the involvement of the United States in these regions during the 90s um, uh, is marked by a very heterogeneous uh, action. So it's marked by some sort of inconsistency. Uh, we see uh, an important intervention in mediation and conflict resolutions, like in the case of the uh, civil war in Angola, and even more in the civil war in, in, sorry, the civil war in Ethiopia, and even more in the civil war in Angola. Uh, we see massive uh, military intervention, like in the case of the uh, Somali civil war in 1991. We see uh, also very low profile uh, involvement and total disengagement as it happened during the Rwandan genocide in 1994. So these are just a few examples to show the, uh, this sort of inconsistencies, these heterogeneous actions of US foreign policy in these areas in the early 90s. Um, uh, and of course, this heterogeneous picture and the mixed uh, results of these actions uh, raise questions about the rationale of US foreign policy in the continent in the immediate uh, post-Cold War period. A rationale which I believe uh, has uh, uh, the roots in the specific way in which the Cold War ended in, in Africa. So, my study of uh, US foreign policy in Africa at the end of the Cold War uh, started precisely from this very point, uh, from starting from the identification of the end of the Cold War Af in Africa. Uh, what, what, what was the end of the Cold War in Africa? Uh, I tried to identify the unique temporal framework, uh, the crucial process, uh, the, the, real, the, the crucial turning points which were meaningful for ending the Cold War in this particular uh, scenario. And I uh, identify uh, 1988 as a major uh, turning point for the end of the uh, Cold War in Africa. Uh, 1988 as the moment when the reset button uh, of the Cold War was, was pushed in, in Africa. Uh, why 1988? Because uh, um, uh, both the Cold War related uh, uh, conflicts in the continent, uh, the, war, the, the war in Southern Africa and the conflicts in the Horn of Africa, both of these conflicts found a solution in 1988 uh, with the signature of two very important agreements, uh, the New York Agreement in Southern Africa and the Ethiopian-Somali Agreement uh, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, so in my study, I saw how the signature of these two agreements uh, put in motion a significant transformation in the political and military, and military dynamics in, in these regions, uh, a transformation which basically split that overlap uh, between the global and the local that was created in the 70s. A transformation that ended up in removing uh, the Cold War paradigm from, uh, from Africa. So for this reason, uh, I like to say that 1988, to some extent, is the Africa's Berlin Wall. Uh, as I said before, <clears throat> the Cold War uh, materialized, developed uh, in Africa through this progressive global, local, uh, um, overlap uh, through these core periphery uh, interconnections. So as a consequence, the end of the Cold War in Africa was uh, the reversal of this process, of these uh, connections, the split of this uh, linkage. Uh, the split of this linkage culminated in 1988. And that's why I say 1988 is the Africa's Berlin Wall. Uh, and this is interesting because 1988, one year before the actual war fell in, in Berlin. So um, with this uh, picture in mind, uh, I, I, I then analyzed uh, US foreign policy uh, in Africa after 1988, after this end of the Cold War uh, in Africa. And 
Uh, what I noticed was that <coughs> in the early uh, 90s, um, uh, US, foreign, US foreign policy uh, in Africa was characterized by a complex um, interaction uh, between uh, two different and uh, uh, coexisting uh, uh, themes, uh, two uh, different and coexisting uh, directions. On the one hand, the United States had to manage the legacy of the, of the Cold War, the legacy and the consequences of the 1988 uh, turning point. On the other hand, the United States also had to uh, face uh, um, challenge, new challenges and new imperatives that came out from that turning point. Uh, and uh, Washington had to find new approaches uh, for its foreign policy and for its involvement in, in the continent. So we have, on the one hand, managing the legacy of the Cold War, on the other hand, finding something new, finding a new approach uh, for the foreign policy in Africa. And I also noted that the US strategy, US foreign policy in Africa was uh, uh, more consistent and more committed for as long as uh, the first uh, theme managing the legacy of the Cold War uh, still offered a guideline. In other words, for as long as the Soviet Union uh, was still there. And this was evident in particular <clears throat> in the way in which after 1988, uh, uh, Washington tried, for instance, to implement a policy of conflict resolution and mediation in several conflicts in Africa in cooperation with the Soviet Union. This was true, as I said before, in the case of the civil war in Ethiopia, and even more in the civil war in Angola, where at some point in 1990, 1991, Moscow and Washington established a formal joint action as mediator in this, in this conflict. And why did the United States do so? Why did the United States cooperate in this way in conflict resolutions uh, in Africa with the Soviet Union? Um, because cooperating with Moscow, cooperating with, with the Soviet Union in one of the peripheral former battlefields of the Cold War helped the broader relations between the two superpowers and it helped the dialogue on the core issues of arms control that was still going on in the early 90s, particularly with the signature of the of the START agreement in 1991. Uh, so basically, the op this was the opposite process that happened during the 70s, when instead the SALT agreement uh, was buried in the sense of the other. Then in the 70s, we have seen how the disagreements between the two superpowers over the regional conflicts in Africa uh, undermined the relationship at the broader level, undermined the TANT process. Uh, at the end of the 80s, early 90s, cooperation in these uh, regional uh, conflicts, in these regional uh, battlefields, instead helped the broader relations. So uh, uh, we see this, this opposite uh, uh, direction, uh, this opposite process. Uh, and this also helped uh, the US foreign policy in Africa, because at that point in the early uh, 90s, up to 1991, Washington could still link its policy in Africa, its strategy in Africa, to a broader strategic uh, imperative, which was the Soviet Union. Cooperating with the Soviet Union uh, accomplished uh, uh, in concluding the dialogue on arms control with the Soviet Union. After the disappearance of the, of the Soviet Union, uh, after the disappearance of this uh, uh, other global actor, uh, and as a new international system based on one uh, superpower was emerging, the discrepancy in the US, in the US action in Africa became uh, more uh, evident. Uh, the United States, the, the US foreign policy became a bit more uh, incoherent and consistent. And this, I believe, was the symptom of the difficulties uh, in, in finding uh, new general rules of conduct in an area uh, where the end of the Cold War had, uh, where the 1988 turning points had removed an important overall strategic uh, imperative. And an example here is, uh, uh, for instance, the, um, um, the intervention of the United States in the Somali uh, in the civil war in 1991. Um, the United States uh, deployed 28,000 uh, soldiers in, in Somalia in 1991, mostly for humanitarian uh, reasons. And uh, as you probably know, that intervention ended up in a disaster with the famous uh, Black Hawk Down uh, incident. And this showed basically the um, 
This, show, this showed how the humanitarian argument that was so common, so fashionable in the, in the New World Order, in the early days of the New World Order, uh, turned out to be contradictory uh, and ultimately insufficient to guide US policy uh, in the continent. Uh, it was not basically as strong as the Soviet imperative had been. Firstly, in terms of confrontation before 1988, particularly during the 70s, and then in terms of cooperation after 1988. And in this regard, I really want to show you uh, this quote from uh, Chester Crocker. Chester Crocker was the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs during the Reagan administration. Uh, he was in office for eight years. He was one of the most influential Assistant Secretary for African Affairs. Um, and during my research, I, I interviewed him. And during our interview, during our talk, he told me precisely these, these words. He said, the Soviets uh, had become what you may call our superpower partners in conflict resolution. We negotiated a bunch of agreements uh, with them. By December 1991, there was no more Soviet Union. Back in the 90s, they forgot about Africa and we lost our partners because they had been our partners in conflict resolution and all of a sudden they are gone and we had no counterparts to bring leaders to bear in these situations and it made it very difficult. So I believe this quote really gives, um, really gives the sense um, of how the existence of the enemy that after 1988 uh, became a counterpart, even, even a partner, if you want. The existence of this other global counterpart was helping the resetting of US foreign policy in Africa. After the disappearance of the Soviet Union, after the disappearance of this uh, partner, as Crocker said, uh, things, uh, things became uh, much more uh, difficult. And so uh, to conclude, uh, let me bring, bring everything back to the, to the two main points, the two main questions I, I asked in, in my book. Uh, when did the Cold War end in Africa and what was post-Cold War US foreign policy in Africa in this uh, unipolar uh, moment in the early 90s? Um, as for the first point, when did the Cold War end in, end in Africa? Um, I said 1988, uh, but the main point here is really to stress how, uh, broadly speaking, in order to fully grasp the turning point of the end of the Cold War, uh, we really first uh, have to understand the ends of the, of the Cold War, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and by investigating uh, these many different ways in which the Cold War ended, in the third world in particular, in its, its global uh, battle, battlegrounds, I believe we can develop also a new perspective for the understanding of this uh, momentous event, the end of the Cold War. And also for the understanding of what came uh, right after, for the understanding of the legacy of the Cold War, for the understanding uh, of that unipolar moment dominated by the United States that followed uh, the end of the Cold War. Uh, I did this for uh, Africa. I tried to investigate the end of the Cold War for Africa. I'm sure maybe this can be done for all the other battlegrounds of the uh, Cold War in order to basically have a, a broader picture of the ends of the Cold War. And uh, secondly, as for the second point, the post-Cold War US foreign policy, uh, broadly speaking, when, when, when it comes to US foreign policy in the unipolar moment, uh, from the study of Africa, of, this, of the case studies of, of Africa, uh, I noticed how, to some extent, and, and I hope this has emerged in my presentation today as well, to some extent, the United States uh, almost needed a global counterpart almost needed another global player. Uh, and I think this opened, um, this opened interesting uh, reflections, particularly in the current historical moment when there is this uh, big debate about the rise of China, for instance, the return of, uh, uh, of Russia, the return of the great power uh, politics, uh, and certainly the end of the American unipolarity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Flavia, for this brilliant presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, Marco, it's your turn yeah. now. Okay. I'll leave you the floor. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to discuss this great book. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Although, of course, I would prefer somehow to do it in person with a drink in hand, uh, but that's, of course, currently not possible. Now, this book is obviously not a book on current US foreign policy towards Africa, but of Washington's role in the Cold War endgame on the African continent. However, I think it's nevertheless very timely and topical, this book. Uh, international historians, they normally try to blow their own trumpet to say how relevant their work is for current international affairs. And I'm not saying that Flavia has done so, but definitely this book, that it is actually relevant for today's affairs, actually the case is almost self-evident. So following, and Flavia has referred to that to some extent, what has been termed already a while ago, the new scramble for Africa, the rise of African terrorist groups linked you know, uh, to, of course, ISIS and before Al-Qaeda, the persistent instability in the Sahel region, and luckily on a more positive note, uh, the substantial growth uh, of a number of African economies, the United States has actually, like other powers, somehow or somewhat regained an interest in Africa. Against this background, the book allows us to learn how Washington engaged with Africa in the past, when actually at the time it already deemed Africa relevant to some extent. And it also allows us to learn actually, eventually why the United States withdrew from the African continent. Consequently, Flavius' book can offer valuable lessons for a period when the United States is again interested in the African continent. Sadly, as during the Cold War, the United States only again interested because it sees a uh, competition for the destiny of the African continent and also, of course, security threats such as reflected in its support to the French forces in Mali. Now, while the book's topicality is, of course, very much to be welcomed and makes it interesting, there are other potentially less ephemeral reasons why it should be celebrated as a remarkable achievement. Firstly, it fills not just one, but various historiographical gaps. Secondly, it addresses numerous pertinent research questions and related issues. And thirdly, it is not only intellectually, but also scientifically and scholarly very rigorous. I would just now like to elaborate on each of these three overarching reasons why I think this book is great and not just topical and timely. I mean, it's great as a historical piece of work. Now, it is relevant, of course, because of this scholarly uh, re uh, value. Uh, it is very relevant for a number of scholars working on Africa, US foreign policy, the Cold War, as well as international relations and security more generally. Now, a few words on the historiographical cases in plural. So the most significant historiographical uh, case for the book stems, in my view, from a very simple fact. It's actually that it is on the Cold War in Africa. Right. So, and of course, the immediate post-Cold War period. Admittedly, research on the impact of the East-West conflict on the African continent has increased significantly over recent and especially the last decade, as illustrated by such works as Nancy Mitchell's book on Jimmy Carter in Africa. But overall, research on Africa's Cold War pales in comparison to research on the Cold War in Europe, but also research on the third world, other third world regions, more prominent ones, such as the Middle East and Asia. Moreover, Africa has also frequently been neglected in general and even in global accounts of the Cold War. This is notably the case uh, very recently, or has been the case very recently, with Paul Thomas Chamberlain's The Cold War's Killing Fields and Lawrence Luthi's Cold Wars. These are, of course, excellent works, and I don't mean any criticism in any way, and privileging the third world, other third world regions over Africa can be justified, as does uh, Chamberlain, who argues that the Cold War was more significant, had a bigger impact, was more intense and more violent, especially in the Middle East and Asia. And also, it did not lead in Africa to as many deaths. And it can also be argued, of course, that's the case. And in Africa, the Cold War also arrived relatively late, at least compared to the these other two regions. However, on the other hand, it should be considered that the East-West conflict in Africa was contemporaneous to the largest decolonization wave ever. And as a corollary, therefore, it had far-reaching and lasting consequences. In addition, 
And as Flavia emphasizes in her book, the Cold War in Africa then further escalated in the Horn of Africa and Southern Africa as a result of uh, stubborn Portuguese colonialism white and white supremacy, radicalized local regimes, and also importantly, increasingly militarized superpower involvement. And this brings me to the second historiographical gap addressed by this book, namely US foreign policy towards Africa in the late Cold War and the immediate post-Cold War period. The United States had traditionally neglected Africa. Only during the Second World War, it gained a temporary interest and a secondary strategic interest in the African continent. As soon as the Second World War was over, that interest evaporated. Then only with the independence of Ghana and in the wake, of course, of the Congo crisis starting in 1960, the United States became truly interested in the African continent. But let's face it, even then, Africa was never of prime strategic importance to the United States, even during John F. Kennedy's charm offensive in the early 1960s. But nevertheless, that's certainly a reason why uh, it has less been studied, the US role in Africa, especially in the late Cold War. But it is very important because as Flavia has shown in a presentation and she especially shows in a book, the United States had a very strong influence during the Cold War for the Cold War, in the Cold War ending and its immediate aftermath. Finally, the book addresses the different ends and endings, and that was highlighted in the presentation, of the Cold War in the Third World by zooming in on, a historiograph on the historiographically most neglected region, which is Africa, because others have started to address a bit more the other Cold War endings in the Third World, but not sufficiently, of course, Africa. Now, moving on to the intellectual relevance or why actually the research questions and related issues are very pertinent. Firstly, and that's related to the third historiographical case, it shows actually that the Cold War in Africa or the end of the Cold War in Africa preceded the end of the Cold War in Europe and the Cold War had different endings in different regions. Already in 1988, the United States and the Soviet Union shifted from a co competition to a cooperation mode albeit, of course, with Washington, uh, sorry, Moscow, increasingly in uh, the junior partner role. Nevertheless, the book also shows that until its demise in 1991, the Soviet Union, however friendly it had become, remained a reference point for US African policy. Secondly, Flavia has assessed the connection and interaction between the core and the periphery. In so doing, and reminding, as she did in her presentation too, the reader of how the Ogaden War adversely affected superpower detente in the 1970s, she convincingly then goes on to show how the rapprochement between the Soviet Union and the United States of the late 1980s came to remove the Cold War from the equation in Africa, right? I, th I found that very interesting. Thirdly, in studying the end of the Cold War in Africa, the book also sheds light on how the East-West conflict and its ending affected the region beyond the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And of course, there was a reference to Black Hawk Down and these tragic events. Fourthly, and relatedly, Flavia has questioned not only how US foreign policy affected Africa and vice versa during the Cold War, but also how Washington's engagement with Africa influenced and reflected the position in the world more broadly of the United States during what uh, has been called the unipolar moment. This allows the reader to learn that as soon as the United States had lost its reference point in Africa, namely the Soviet Union, it became somewhat disoriented. As a result, comparatively minor setbacks led the Americans to abandon Africa in the early 1990s after extensive and decades long Cold War motivated interference and resulting devastation. Last but not least, the book analyzes how the Cold War ended in the two hotspots of late Cold War Africa, Southern Africa and of course the Horn. And if we look at the Horn in the 90s and even now, of course, the security situation uh, continued to be very precarious and is still very precarious, very problematic. And these countries continue, the countries in these regions continue to suffer from 
the legacy of the Cold War, which had superimposed itself on local and regional conflicts. Finally, uh, purely academically, allow me to say a few words about the scholarly rigor of this book. So the research on which this book is based is truly impressive. Flavia has notably carried out really extensive and groundbreaking archival research in the United States. Moreover, the vast corpus of primary sources, and we saw that with a quote towards the end, has been complemented by interviews in both the United States and Africa. Finally, and despite the book's US focus, she has also tried to reduce the US-centric source base by carrying out archival research in South Africa and relying on published uh, Soviet and Cuban sources. This has ultimately allowed her not to lose sight of other also local actors in the ending of Africa's Cold War. Now, to conclude, in sum, in addition to just being a fascinating read, this book is topical, original, significant, and rigorous to use to paraphrase ref speak somehow. I can just only recommend that you read the book if you haven't already done so. So thank you again for having me here. And I would have a couple of questions, but I think we'd rather open the floor, if that's okay, to for the chair. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, definitely. We have plenty of time now to uh, open the floor to any questions that the audience might have. I uh, invite you again to type down any question you might have in the chat function or in the Q&A function. So um, we do have a question, actually. Are you ready, Flavia? Yes, yes, please. Um, I would like to ask if China has started playing the role the, uh, the Soviet Union had played during the Cold War in Africa, and if the US needs this geoeconomical activity of China in Africa, as China is becoming the new counterpart of the US. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this question. This is actually a very common question, whether the um, uh, U.S.-Chinese rivalry at the global level, broadly speaking, and then in this uh, situation, in this case, uh, in Africa, is basically um, uh, the, the, the can play the role of the, the substitution of the U.S.-Soviet uh, uh, rivalry, or if it is similar to that um, to that rivalry. Um, I think to answer your question uh, to some extent, yes, in the sense that, of course, the geoeconomical activity of China in Africa can create a sort of threat uh, for the United States, which in some way can uh, uh, right, redirect uh, US foreign policy in Africa or create at least a common uh, overarching aim in, uh, in the US foreign policy in Africa. Uh, I don't think, however, that the, whatever competition, whatever relationship between uh, China and the United States will happen in Africa, uh, this is going to be uh, similar uh, or even less identical to the type of relations that the, uh, to, to the type of bipolar dynamic that the United States and the Soviet Union had uh, in Africa during the Cold War. Um, I believe uh, there is a lack of uh, uh, an ideological, a strong ideological uh, aspect, a strong ideological opposition, uh, as as it was during the uh, Cold War. Um, and also economically uh, speaking, uh, during the Cold War in Africa, we saw two, uh, like in the rest of the world, but in Africa in particular, we saw uh, the clash, the opposition, the rivalry between two completely different uh, economic uh, system. Uh, why this is not going to happen with, uh, uh, with uh, China and the United States. Um, an aspect that probably uh, I would be interested in seeing in the future is to what extent the um, arrival of China, the expansion of China, the economical activity of China in Africa will affect or not uh, the relations uh, between uh, the Western countries in, uh, in Africa. That's another interesting aspect, particularly the relationship between the United States uh, and the former uh, colonial powers, France and and UK in particular, because uh, uh, particularly uh, as Marco stressed, uh, this uh, um, combination between Cold War and decolonization created a series of interesting dynamics during during the Cold War. 
So uh, during the Cold War, we see how the relations between uh, uh, the former colonial empires, uh, France and Britain in particular, and the United States uh, were in some way um, and the possible competition among these three powers were in some way um, silenced or overshadowed by uh, the common enemy, by the need to uh, basically be united against the common enemy, the uh, Soviet Union. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, the geoeconomical activity in China, in Africa, is going to affect, again, the relations between uh, these Western countries uh, in, in Africa. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Flavia. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, what was the US policy towards Rwanda from 91 to 94, specifically in the run up to the genocide? Oh, well, that's, I would need like three hours to answer this, this question. Uh, what was the US policy towards Rwanda from 1991 to 1994? Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, this episode, I mean, Rwanda is uh, uh, remembered as one of the blackest pages in the history of the United Nations and also in the history of the US foreign policy. Um, the United States uh, has often been blamed uh, for being the major responsible for the lack of intervention of, uh, of the United um, uh, State of the United Nations in, uh, in the um, in, in Rwanda. Um, a common view is that the United States uh, did not intervene in Rwanda uh, after, because of the disastrous intervention in Somalia, the previous disastrous intervention in Somalia, the Black Hawk Down incident that I mentioned during my presentation. Uh, that, inc that incident was a real shock for the United States. Uh, uh, the death of uh, 18 uh, Marines, uh, the uh, basically the so-called CNN effect, this event broadcasted all over the world. So this was a real shock. And so a common view is that uh, when another crisis broke out in, uh, in Africa, in another very small countries with absolutely no significance or interest for the United States, the United States decided not to get involved uh, once again. This is true to some extent. It's true that um, basically what happened in Somalia affected uh, the U.S. Uh, attitude, the U.S. policy towards the Rwandan genocide. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what happened in, the, in Rwanda was also, uh, and the lack of involvement, the disengagement of the United States in Rwanda was also the result of an unclear relationship with the United uh, Nations. Of course, uh, after the end of the Cold War, uh, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the United Nations uh, emerged uh, once again uh, as, a, as an important actor in the global arena. Uh, during the Cold War, the United Nations was almost insignificant because of these veto gains between the two uh, superpowers was inefficient for these reasons. So once the veto game disappears, the bipolar logic disappears, there was this hope that the United Nations could uh, play an important role uh, in the international system and could finally become what the founding fathers wanted the United Nations to be, namely an efficient mechanism to settle the international crisis. And the obvious problem at that point was how the United States, uh, the superpower, the unipolar superpower, the unchallenged superpower would have, uh, would, uh, basically interacted with the United Nations. Uh, the United States never, ever, ever wanted uh, to act internationally through the United uh, Nations. And this was uh, clear far before the, uh, uh, the Black Hawk Down incident and the genocide uh, in, uh, in Rwanda. And so uh, the United States has always conceived that the United Nations, even in the, in the most successful uh, intervention of the United Nations, which was the Gulf War in 1991, has always considered the United Nations just one of the possible tools at disposal of the unipolar uh, superpower. And, and this uh, basically unclear, unsolved, uh, and difficult relations between the United States and the United Nations was also another important factor that led to the lack of intervention and lack of engagement of uh, the United States in, uh, in Rwanda. This is just very in a nutshell because we could talk about this forever, but I'm afraid it's going to be boring. Not at all. Thank you, uh, Flavia. Uh, we have more questions. So the first is about 
Um, can you share some experiences of working with archives in Africa? I hear archives in South Africa have got more difficult to access recently, not just to the COVID. Did you find this was the case? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I mean, in, uh, in Africa, I uh, consulted only the, um, uh, the uh, precisely the archives in, uh, in uh, South Africa, uh, which is uh, among the uh, countries uh, that I studied in my, in my um, book, uh, basically is the only accessible uh, archives in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Africa. I couldn't go, uh, of course, in the archives in Somalia. Of course, um, uh, I, I really had a, a very, a very nice experience there. Um, the acts, I mean, the South African archives um, are. Um, I think they are the most uh, unexplored uh, and un, uh, and underutilized archives in the history of the Cold War. There is really a lot. Uh, a lot in those uh, archives. Uh, the access was uh, easy uh, in terms of physically access to the archives. Uh, the organizations of the materials uh, a bit less uh, easy to follow. Um, uh, much uh, was dependent on the personal uh, relationship you established with the main uh, archivist there, who now I think got his retirement, uh, so it's not there anymore. Um, but uh, Again, I think I think it was a very a very interesting experience. Um, the access in terms of organization of the material is a bit difficult, uh, but I think the South African archives are really something that is worth exploring because I believe uh, there are still a lot of underutilized uh, uh, sources uh, there. Thank you, Flavia. Um... Someone else is asking here, I think your main argument, the end of the Cold War in Africa preceded the end of the Cold War elsewhere, is fascinating. Can you maybe give us a hint on how the local actors, for example, the African governments and political movements, reacted to this early disengagement? Uh, sorry. Uh, can I go with a hint of how the local actors uh, reacted to this early uh, uh, disengagement? Um, well, uh, I mean, uh, again, my, my book is, is mostly on, uh, uh, on U.S. foreign policies. So also when I mentioned 1988, uh, uh, I, I refer mostly to the end of the superpower rivalry and the superpower uh, competitions in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the Cold War. Um, uh, um, the local actors, um, the African governments and political movements, how they reacted to this early disengagement. Uh, of course, um, I, I studied this aspect uh, for uh, an interesting uh, finding is, was the case of uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia that was uh, traditionally a, a US, uh, I'm sorry, a Soviet uh, ally throughout the uh, Cold War. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, uh, basically uh, with, the, with the collapse of the um, uh, regime of Mengistu in Ethiopia, the new government basically said, okay, let's uh, establish a strong relationship with the, with the United States. After all, a superpower is a superpower. So we really don't mind if it's the Soviet Union or the, or the United States. So uh, to some extent, there was this um, attempt from some of the local uh, actors, the African governments, to establish good relationship with the, with the United States. Another case was certainly uh, South Africa, uh, when the ANC um, took power in, uh, in won the elections in, in 1994 in, in South Africa. Uh, the, um, um, Nelson Mandela, the relationship between Nelson Mandela and, and the Clinton administration, for instance, was very, uh, was very strong. And that's even more interesting because throughout the Cold War, uh, the ANC was considered a sort of terrorist communist uh, organization and Nelson Mandela like a terrorist, uh, a communist terrorist. Uh, so it's interesting how instead the relationship immediately changed after the, uh, the end of the Cold War and South Africa also had uh, much interest in, in established um, good relationship with the, with, the, with the United States, particularly the United States uh, um, uh, 
uh, was interested in developing a free market economy in, in, uh, in South Africa, uh, considering the relationship that uh, the ANC had had with the Communist Party in South Africa throughout the Cold War. There was a lot of interest in, in instead keeping a free market um, uh, uh, economy in, in South Africa. So uh, basically, what I've noticed in my studies that many, several local actors and African governments had interest in, in, in developing a uh, um, a strong relationship with the United States after the disappearance of the Soviet Union, after the end of the Cold War. Uh, I didn't see, but again, that was not the focus on my book specifically, but from what I see, I didn't notice a sort of uh, reaction against the general disengagement from the continent. So the idea was to uh, establish good bilateral uh, relationship with the, with the United States. Uh, but I didn't uh, notice, I didn't find in my research uh, uh, any particular reaction uh, concerning the general uh, disengagement from, from the continent. Thank you. Um, Marco, would you like to ask those questions to uh, Flavia, perhaps, and get back in the conversation? If there's no other remaining question, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so, uh, Two rather provocative questions. Um, the first, because, you know, to be credible, I also have to be a bit critical or provocative. Um, so in terms of sources, you discussed African sources, that kind of stuff we covered. Now, and I remember it from having some discussions with you, whether you could think of using uh, other European, uh, you know, uh, from the metropoles sources, such as France, for instance, uh, I mean, Britain to some extent, but France especially with its uh, continued involvement, uh, the Safari Club at the end. So um, whether well, you could say something on that. And then another uh, generally provocative question, I fear. Um, so the Cold War uh, has been blamed for much of Africa's uh, woes in the 1990s, and you know, certainly rightly so. Um, but somehow, with the departure of the superpowers, the lid was also taken off. I mean, if we look, for instance, at Zaire, Congo, um, but then, of course, you can say it was the Cold War in the first place that contributed to the mess there, right? So I'm not trying to make here any apologies, but, you know, what do you think is the relationship there? So it was really like a bit, a bit like, you know, Tito gone in Yugoslavia, that kind of uh, issue. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Marco. In terms of the uh, sources, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, other accessible uh, sources concerning uh, this area and this period uh, in history are certainly the British and the French archives. I um, consulted some uh, British documents, particularly concerning the relationship uh, between uh, the United States and Britain concerning uh, South Africa, uh, and this is particularly during the 80s. As I mentioned before, when I was talking about Nelson Mandela and the ANC, um, despite the fact that in Britain there was probably the biggest and the strongest anti-apartheid movement, global anti-apartheid movement, uh, the government of Margaret Thatcher, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, was particularly um, hostile to the ANC and to Nelson Mandela. Uh, she mentioned um, uh, very often how basically they were considered just a communist organization and of course this uh, to some extent affected the way uh, in which the united states acted uh, towards south africa i remember having this uh, conversation with uh, uh, chester stroker uh, i mentioned when i when i interviewed him he told me well of course when you have the british prime minister uh, calling the anc and nelson mandela a terrorist a communist terrorist uh, you have to at least take into consideration uh, you know it's a kind of something you have to, to consider in, in developing your policy towards the ANC or, or to establish a dialogue as the United States did uh, uh, after 1988 with the ANC. Uh, so yeah, uh, of course, this, uh, I consulted a bit the British sources in this uh, regard. Um, yeah, probably the French sources would have added uh, something, uh, um, some more insights um, to, to my book. Uh, I, I agree uh, with you. Um, I didn't want to uh, shift too much the attention uh, from U.S. foreign policy um, by including too many Western actors uh, in, in Africa, but uh, certainly, I mean, uh, for future <laughs> studies, I will uh, certainly uh, take uh, your advice and, and probably uh, include more uh, other um, sources from the former colonial powers. 
Thank you, Marco. And in terms of the second question, uh, sorry, could you please repeat the second question? No, but do you think, because you studied extensively the end of the Cold War and we see somehow the human humanitarian situation further unravel or continuing to unravel once the superpowers, I mean, especially if you think, uh, I mean, of course, there is the Horn, which is a quite obvious case uh, with, you know, Somalia, but then there is also, of course, West Africa, if we think about, uh, you know, the civil wars that happened there. So how can we perhaps relate that to the Cold War? And what's the influence of actually the superpowers leaving? First, the Soviet Union, then the United States. And that's also the period in the 90s when you have the most African-led peacekeeping efforts, notably through ECOWAS. So what was the kind of, uh, you know, triggering the departure kind of effect of the superpowers uh, uh, in relation to the legacy of the Cold War? Uh, uh, I, th I think uh, I, I'm not focused very much on that area that you mentioned, particularly on the ECOWAS, or the area of uh, West Africa. You, you are the expert here on, on, on West Africa. Uh, but I, I think the, um, it is connected, broadly speaking, to what I said uh, before, uh, this idea that um, after the end of the Cold War, after the disappearance of the Soviet Union, there was this idea that the United Nations could finally become what they were supposed to be. So an efficient mechanism to intervene in these uh, conflicts to avoid the uh, violation of human rights. And peacekeeping at the time looked a very, very easy uh, tool for, uh, uh, for uh, doing this job. So um, in a moment in which the Security Council was not uh, uh, paralyzed, uh, frozen uh, any longer by the superpowers competition by the veto game between the two uh, superpowers, uh, probably the expansion, that was the reason why the, we can see this expansion of uh, the peacekeeping uh, operations also in, in, in West Africa. So I think the connection is this one, the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the disappearance of the veto game uh, in the Security Council and the paralysis of the Security Council after the disappearance of, of the Soviet Union. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. I think we still have some time for some some other questions. Um, so um, this falls outside okay, the, the range that you cover in your book in terms of years, but um, there's a question about how do you see the period of the 60s when there was vigorous action by the United States through covered operations such as the conflict in the Congo, or particularly uh, support for uh, Portugal through NATO in their colonial wars. Any thought on that? Uh, I mean, how do I see this period in, in, in which sense? Uh, of course, yeah, the United States uh, basically intervened in Congo. Actually, the, the Congo crisis in the 60s was the, um, the uh, first Cold War related conflict in, in the continent and uh, the intervention, the cover operation of the United States in Congo was the first uh, uh, official intervention of the United States in Africa as a Cold War uh, battlefield. The United States intervened in Congo in order to avoid that the crisis that happened after uh, the departure of the Belgium and the first uh, uh, elections with uh, Patrice Lumumba uh, uh, taking power, becoming prime minister, um, so the United States intervened in order to avoid this crisis, could open the doors to the uh, intervention of the Soviet Union, and in particular in order to avoid that the mineral-rich uh, Congo could uh, end up in the hand of the Soviet. Uh, let's not forget that the uranium of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from, uh, from Congo. So, uh, of course, uh, there was a, a, a strategic interest for this intervention. Uh, the same with Portugal. So basically, uh, a general comment here is that throughout the Cold War, the United States always saw Africa, at least mostly saw Africa, through the lens of the Cold War. Uh, so the intervention in Congo, the intervention in, uh, in uh, also in supporting Portugal um, was uh, uh, because all these interventions were seen through the lens of the Cold War, was to avoid the intervention of the, the expansion of the Soviet Union, mostly, and of course, simplified, there were some nuances, but 
overall this was the lens through which the United States looked at Africa and this created two uh, uh, outcomes. On the one hand, the United States ended up in supporting horrible regimes and colonial uh, powers. Congo is one of the cases. I mean, through the CIA covert operation, Mobutu was brought to power for 30 years in Congo, and we're still seeing the consequence of that regime. On the other hand, the, the Cold War lens uh, also helped uh, uh, to link what was otherwise uh, an overall marginal area the African continent to the central directive of US foreign policy, which was the Cold War. Yes, Marco, yes, something to say. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Just briefly to come in. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. I just, uh, you know, I'm quite interested in the 1960s, and that is more a comment rather than a question, if I may. Um, it's interesting. Somehow, somewhat, the Congo crisis tends sometimes to overshadow the Cold War, the early Cold War in Africa, which predominantly played out in West Africa. So Guinea, mm -hmm. Ghana, Mali, these kind of places. And I think what is interesting is if, I mean, Flavio is far more than me on the 70s, but if I oppose the 70s to the 60s as a Cold War, you have very much the, in the 60s, it's more of an economic model competition. It's between the Soviet model of development and the US-led modernization theory. So if you look at US documents on the 1960s, it's all about trying to avoid an arms race. And for instance, arms exports to Africa, always focused on Ethiopia, of course, before certain events, revolution, so on, I mean, even after the revolution, of course, um, to some extent, uh, by the Americans to Africa. But otherwise, Africa in the 60s received hardly anything in weapons from the United States. For instance, there was a ceiling of 25 million uh, when it came to annual ceiling, 25 million dollars uh, uh, for exports to Africa. So it's very much an economic model competition. It was much more, uh, you know, it was a softer approach and then it became increasingly militarized because both superpowers realized in the early 1960s that you couldn't just buy them and then they would definitely align with you. It was more fluctuating the whole situation as the Soviets had to learn in Guinea, for instance. Uh, and then of course, I mean, even there were bits supplanted by the Chinese uh, in Kwame Kwa Nkrumah's Ghana. And uh, in general, so the situation was difficult, even though, for instance, John F. Kennedy's charm offensive in the early 1960s, uh, you know, uh, dispersing huge sums in development aid in Africa did not uh, bring the expected dividends. So I would largely oppose 60s Cold War despite the Congo, and I'm not, you know, minimizing any of that or minimizing other violence that was taking place and uh, covert operations, some of them more debatable than others uh, in terms of proof. Um, but nevertheless, it was more peaceful so to speak, than actually the 1970s when it really became more radicalized and militarized. And you can really easy, easily look at this, even if you just, uh, you know, look at arms transfers, for instance, on CIPRI uh, databases, for instance. Sorry, I just uh, <laughs> thought that was interesting. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, thank you, Mark. So, um, we have another interesting question. Um, to what extent was the US foreign policy shaped and guided by Cuban adventurism in Southern Africa as opposed to a straight superpower competition with the Soviet Union? Uh, it, it was certainly guided by the Cuban intervention in, in Africa, particularly in, in Angola. I, of course, uh, I've been talking a lot about uh, US, uh, um, the United States and the Soviet Union, but uh, I, I, I briefly, I, of course, uh, we, we, we can stay here uh, three hours. <laughs> I had to brutally oversimplify it in some way. I mentioned in my presentation, however, the important role of other global actors, uh, uh, China, first of all, and, uh, uh, and Cuba. Cuba played a massive role in, uh, in uh, Southern Africa uh, with the intervention and support of the NPLA regime in, uh, um, in Angola. So, uh, why and the US foreign policy was shaped by the Cuban adventurism in Southern Africa or intervention in, in Southern Africa. Uh, but uh, from the US perspective, this was not opposed uh, to the superpower competition with the Soviet Union. The United States saw the Cubans as uh, I use a strong word here as Soviet proxies, or at least as a uh, tool of the of the Soviet Union as a just a monolithic bloc. This was not absolutely the case. Cuba, Fidel Castro had a very independent uh, policy uh, in Africa. 
very independent uh, from the Soviet Union, sometimes in, in contradiction with the Soviet Union. In many cases, uh, the Castro regimes uh, took decisions in, in Angola, in Southern Africa, uh, without even consulting um, um, the Soviet Union uh, first. But uh, this nuance, this difference, uh, was not completely grasped uh, by, um, by, the, by the United States. Uh, um, the United States still saw the Cubans as a monolithic bloc, uh, together with the, with the Soviet Union, overall, of course. Okay, great. Um, I think we covered pretty much all questions, um, unless some last one pops up. Um, there are actually a lot of comments as well in the chat, you may want to take a look afterwards. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> um, otherwise, um, Marco, do you want to add some um, concluding remarks? Or Flavia, otherwise. Uh... I also, uh, if you mind, I also put my email address on the on the chat if someone wants to contact me. Yeah. And, uh, just in case, thank you. For some uh, final feedback. Okay, so well, thank you very much, uh, Flavia, for this interesting presentation, and thank you, Marco, for being our discussion today. Uh, also, thanks to the Center for Grand Strategy for organizing this uh, book launch and obviously thanks to um, our audience, our participants for uh, listening and for um, your questions. Thanks a lot and have a good evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.